My name is Ryan Paul. I teach history here at SUU, and I'm the director of Eccles Apex. And on behalf of myself and the Eccles Apex team, Sophie Javage, Faith Christensen, and Kaysen Graff, I want to welcome you to this year's Festival of Excellence keynote, Psychology and Climate Change, Understanding Impacts and Responses. I would also like to thank the Eccles Foundation for their generous and continuous support of this program, the Festival of Excellence Committee, anthropology professor Dr. Crystal Koenig, and the Provost Office for making this event possible. I would like to remind you that today's conversation will continue on the Eccles Apex Radio Hour podcast, which is available wherever you get your podcasts. This year's Festival of Excellence keynote speaker, Dr. Susan Clayton, is the Whitmore Williams Professor of Psychology and Chair of Environmental Studies at the College of Worcester in the great state of Ohio. She holds a PhD in social psychology from Yale University. She has authored and edited five books, including Psychology and Climate Change, Human Perceptions, Impacts and Responses, The Oxford Handbook of Environmental and Conservation Psychology, Identity and the Natural Environment, The Psychological Significance of Nature, and Conservation Psychology, Understanding and Promoting Human Care for Nature. She co-authored the American Psychological Association Report on Psychology and Global Climate Change and Psychological Impacts of Climate Change. Clayton is a fellow of the American Psychological Association and of the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues. It is now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Susan Clayton to Southern Utah University and the Festival of Excellence stage. It is such a pleasure to be here as part of this event and an honor. I was so uh, impressed as I saw that list of previous speakers. Here we go. So thanks so much to um, those of you who invited me and arranged this day, and congratulations to all the students who are participating in the Festival of Excellence. Uh, my job today is to talk to you about psychology and climate change. And I know you've all thought something or heard something or know something about climate change, but many of you probably have no idea why psychology would be relevant or um, you know, why a psychologist is here talking to you about climate change. So really, that's, that's my primary goal, to tell you why I'm here. And I get this question a lot. I've gotten this question, um, including from a lot of psychologists. Why should psychologists get involved in addressing climate change? And the sort of first foundational answer is that climate change is such a significant thing that everybody should be involved in addressing it. Everybody should be thinking about it and how it relates to them, both at a personal and a professional level. And here's a quote from last fall from the head of the UN um, in very apocalyptic language saying humanity has opened the gates to hell. So just a reminder of what a big deal it is to um, to be experiencing what increasingly is being called the climate crisis. And in early days, um, fairly early days, maybe 10 years ago of thinking about climate change, a lot of the messaging had to do with polar bears on ice caps, right? You probably all saw the polar bears on little slabs of ice and um, starving and looking very sad. And so with, there was a mistaken impression that maybe climate change was mostly threatening polar bears, but it's really threatening human beings at a very fundamental level, um, not to mention broader ecosystems. So some of the negative impacts, threats to biodiversity as species are struggling to adapt um, or cope with changing environmental conditions, damaged infrastructure. We know that you know, major storms and high temperatures threaten our built environment, their economic impacts, and especially relevant to me as a psychologist, their threats to human health. So some of the goals of psychology, and um, you can find these listed on the American Psychological Association's website if you want, um, to understand predictors of mental distress and conversely well-being and to promote healthy behaviors and resilience in the face of all the kinds of challenges we face in our lives. So uh, I think this is very relevant to thinking about how people will uh, respond, how their mental well-being will be affected by climate change, and how they can be resilient in the face of those challenges. 
So just think about what climate change looks like. And here are some headlines from uh, the past few months, I think maybe the past six months. Um, searing heat, we're not so much aware of that now, uh, but I think many of us were aware of it last summer. Um, record levels of natural disasters associated with climate change. And of course, um, the warmest February on record was just completed. So we, we are seeing right now, right today, uh, and right in our area, these impacts of climate change. And there are consequences to human well-being. So 20 million people displaced by extreme weather events, half a million killed, um, a third of Americans who say they've been personally affected um, just in the past two years, and 90% of American counties experiencing a climate disaster. So it's not just affecting a small proportion of people. It's not just affecting people in other places around the world. It's affecting us here at home. And not surprisingly, these extreme weather events have impacts on our mental health. And there's lots and lots of data to show this. We've been studying the impacts of extreme weather events since well before they were linked to climate change, so we have decades of data. We know that following the experience of something like a hurricane, a tornado, a wildfire, um, you, you get increased rates of post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, suicide, substance abuse, um, even interpersonal violence and sleep disorders. So some of the examples, um, uh, you may remember Hurricane Maria not that many years ago in Puerto Rico, um, doubling in post-traumatic stress disorder, suicide increased, mental health services were required by more people. More recently, the California Camp Fire. And I think this, um, certainly to me and I think to a lot of people, kind of brought home that uh, it is affecting Americans on sort of mainland American soil, places that you think of as relatively privileged and protected um, were not immune from the effects of the wildfire. And among those directly affected by this wildfire in the sense that they lost, you know, perhaps their homes, um, tripling rate of post-traumatic stress disorder, doubling in anxiety and depression, but even indirect exposure, just being aware of other people who'd experienced those kinds of effects predicted anxiety and depression. And particularly, and I, I point this out to show kind of the mechanisms by which this happens, um, sleep disturbances. Uh, of course you're going to experience a sleep disturbance if you live through an event like that. Um, that makes it more likely that you're going to be vulnerable to these mental health problems. Um, but people who said that they felt they were particularly resilient, that they were good at bouncing back after tough times, we're less likely to experience those mental health problems. And again, I point that out to say, it's not just a matter of um, this is going to hit us all and there's nothing we can do about it. There are things we can do about it. In 2019 and 20, there were very serious Australian bushfires, um, very traumatic. Uh, uh, I was uh, communicating with people who were there at the time who had young children and were talking about how difficult it was to talk to their children about this. Um, so in this particular study, hundreds of Australians completed measures of mental health and again, increased depression, anxiety, stress, substance abuse. Also, they began to feel more personally vulnerable to climate change. So we sometimes talk about psychological distance, how climate change can feel like something that's very far away. But of course, when you're observing these effects, it seems closer. Um, and then people become more distressed and more concerned. And these impacts don't necessarily resolve in the days or weeks or even months following an event. Uh, they can last. Um, a year after the 2016 wildfire in Alberta, for example, we still found elevated rates of mental health problems with a third of the people who were affected um, reporting some kind of mental health problem, um, particularly likely among people who had personally been displaced or watched homes being destroyed, um, and among first responders. And I think it's important to remember that those people who, who come in to help those who are being affected by these events um, are themselves particularly at risk for mental health consequences. And when I talk about mental health, so this is all about um, you know, mental disorders, anxiety, depression, 
if you were if you know psychology and if you were listening to the introduction i'm not a clinical psychologist i'm a social psychologist so mental health um, defined in those terms of clinical diagnoses is not really my uh, my primary area of expertise but if you think very broadly about mental health it includes more fundamentally well-being. It includes the ability to function cognitively. It includes your ability to have normal social relationships. And this is not just my perception, this is the World Health Organization's definition of what it means to be healthy is optimal functioning. So thinking about mental health in this broader sense, we start to recognize that extreme weather events can also impact cognitive functioning. And this is the only study that I've seen so far, but a recent study found um, differences in the brain function of people who've been exposed to wildfire. Um, they essentially were seeming to need more brain activity to accomplish the same functions. Um, and not just the cognitive processes, but also the social relationships are, again, part of our well being. So I've just asked you to think broadly about mental health. I also want you to think broadly about um, climate change. What does climate change look like? I've just been talking about extreme weather events and wildfires. And by the way, people now use the term extreme weather event um, rather than natural disaster because of this blurring of the line between what's natural and what's not natural. So let's just call them extreme. But climate change also, of course, includes drought includes high levels of heat. Things that are not as dramatic, you don't sort of wake up one day and say, oh my gosh, the sea levels are so much higher than they were yesterday. But climate change includes those gradual changes in sea levels, gradual thawing of permafrost that is putting homes and communities in Alaska at risk, for example, melting glaciers that are threatening people's access to fresh water, also, air quality. Um, climate change is associated with worse air quality for multiple reasons, the most obvious one being that the things that cause climate change are also contributing to pollution. So the burning of fossil fuels and air pollution is already um, responsible for quite a lot of deaths per year. So even if there were no climate change, that would be worth cleaning up. Um, warmer air also tends to hold more pollutants um, more allergens, so uh, increased allergies are actually another consequence of climate change. Food insecurity is considered to be one of the biggest threats posed by climate change um, because agriculture is threatened and because some crops, and this is out of my area of expertise, but research is showing that some crops have less nutritional value when they're raised in higher temperatures. Spread of diseases, we're all very aware of the spread of disease um, after having lived through the um, COVID pandemic. I'm stopping to think, have we lived through it? Well, we certainly lived in it. Um, but I'm sure you've, you've all also heard about things like uh, Zika and um, the part of country where I'm from, Lyme disease. The insects have a broader range because of the warmer temperatures and they carry the diseases further. Loss of place as people are forced to migrate loss of biodiversity, as I mentioned earlier, so people might have less access to healthy nature. And there is a ton of evidence that just, um, I was admiring the trees outside the window just a few minutes ago. Access to beautiful natural settings, I don't need to tell those of you here, are very good for us. They're very good for our mental health, for reducing stress, actually even promoting positive social relations. So when that, that access is threatened, that threatens our health. And then, as I mentioned earlier, damaged infrastructure, economic disruptions, all of these can be linked to climate change. So if we're really going to describe the impacts of climate change on human health, we need to think about those as well. Heat in particular, I think, you know, uh, climate change sometimes referred to as global warming, a term that people have moved away from because it only it only describes part of what climate change includes, but it certainly is an important part average temperatures are increasing, we have a lot of evidence about impacts of heat on mental health because um, this is something that people have studied for years, again, before they were really thinking about climate change. And uh, for those of you who are researchers, heat is something you can actually manipulate experimentally and see how it affects people. So you can put people in a room, turn up the thermometer, thermostat, and see if that affects their cognitive abilities and their social interactions.
Um, we do know that higher temperatures are associated with increases in suicide. This is not something that has been studied experimentally, but it is um, conclusions based on looking at, uh, at suicide rates in areas that are experiencing a period of unusually high temperatures. Um, similarly, increase in psychiatric hospitalizations. Aggression, that is something that's been observed experimentally. And decreases in happiness and positive mood. And some of the researchers that have been looking at this, this is fairly new research in some cases, been using massive data sets, um, including social media posts that you can uh, kind of tag to a specific geological or geographical location, see what the temperatures were in that location. And it turns out people are less likely to post um, like Twitter posts or other social media posts that have positive words in them when the temperatures are high. So we're just not as happy when it's too hot. And some of you are um, probably aware of the threats to physical and mental functioning. If you think of people who are working outdoors, um, in some cases they literally cannot do their work in the middle of the day, it's too hot. So you have uh, agricultural laborers in some parts of the world having to get up at four o'clock in the morning so they can put in a few hours before it gets too hot to work anymore. Mental functioning is also compromised. Um, students do less well on exams, uh, less well on homework if they're in, uh, if the temperatures are high and they don't have air conditioning. Heat affects our interpersonal behavior. As I mentioned already, it's associated with increases in aggression, both at the interpersonal level and at the intergroup level. Um, really good research that has shown that they're more likely to have intergroup conflicts when the temperatures are high. And people are less nice to each other, something you may have noticed yourself. Um, there are a lot of different explanations for why this might be. Some of it is just that heat is unpleasant and it's kind of arousing. Uh, any of you who are psychology students might have um, heard about the frustration aggression hypothesis. If you want to be cool and you can't get cool, you just get frustrated and you become on edge and you're less nice to other people. Um, if you're focused on how hot you are, you you're tend to have a narrowing of attention span. So you're less able to think creatively about um, ways to solve problems. Or you're more likely to maybe make worse attributions about somebody else's behavior and think, oh, they did that just to annoy me, as opposed to trying to think of alternative explanations. And very fundamentally, uh, many of you may have experienced this. When it's really hot, it's hard to sleep. If you have air conditioning, you don't tend to notice that as much, but lots and lots of places around the world do not have air conditioning. Lots of lots of people in the United States don't have air conditioning. And if you can't sleep, some of you know how difficult it is to function. Again, you become more irritable, your mind's not as sharp, um, you're probably more likely to make mistakes if you're working on an assembly line, things like that. So social relationships are impaired by climate change. And not just um, because of heat, but also because uh, in some cases when the temperatures are too hot, it's just hard to have the opportunity to interact with each other. If you live in the kind of place where people hang out on the front porch or they walk around the, the community chatting with their neighbors, um, when it's really hot, you don't want to do that. You go inside. Um, sometimes you really need to go inside if it's too hot. Alternatively, uh, if you live in a kind of in a part of the world where you depend on it being really cold to interact. So people who live in the far north, uh, sometimes during the winter, uh, they get around on snowmobiles. They cross frozen lakes. This is how they interact with their neighbors. Well, recently, sometimes you can't rely on the lakes being frozen um, or uh, the snow is melting and the ground is really muddy. You can't use your snowmobile, but you can't really reliably use a regular car or in a wheeled vehicle either. So they're just not as able to interact with their neighbors. And this is really important um, in general. It's very important to our mental health because social connections are a truly fundamental part of our resilience to all kinds of stressors. And they're very strongly associated with not just mental, but physical health as well. Continuing my litany of terrible things, I will get to an end of, of this part. Um, some of the indirect impacts of climate change are really important to think about as we think about health and well-being, especially um, people who are forced to, people who are displaced against their will, people who are forced to migrate. Um, perhaps the place they're living just becomes less desirable 
can, it can no longer support agriculture, it can no longer support fishing, or maybe it actually disappears because they live in a coastal area and it disappears into the ocean. Um, obviously, a lot of people's jobs are threatened by climate change, so economic status is a threat. Also, if you lose your home in an extreme weather event, there's often economic impacts. And food insecurity, as I already mentioned, a big problem. So for, for migrants um, who are migrating, who are involuntary migrants, they didn't want to do this. Um, it's a very stressful activity. Um, it's stressful to think about migrating. It's stressful to be faced with the conditions that force you to migrate. Actually migrating is stressful. And then when you get where you're going, it's still stressful. So immigrants are at increased risk of psychosis. And this is true not just for people who actually migrated, but the second generation, because they still may feel not completely welcomed in the new place. So simply the fact of increased migration is going to increase mental health problems. Economic insecurity is also associated with mental health problems, and it's primarily it's just a stressor. If you're stressed all the time, you're more vulnerable to all kinds of health problems. So having a lower income is associated with more depression and anxiety. Um, we, can, we know that this is not just a correlational uh, association, but actually there's a causal link because people who um, are the beneficiaries of anti-poverty programs tend to show improved mental health. And especially it's important when we think about mental health and well-being to recognize that things that are experienced by children, even, even fetuses, even um, before birth, can increase risk to their developmental trajectory and result in uh, impaired cognitive functioning or mental illness as an adult. And you find very similar effects of food insecurity. So again, it's very stressful, associated with impaired mental health. Um, for children who experience food insecurity, there's a greater lifetime incidence of depression. And um, even when you think of people who have the same amount of household income, but some are more confident of having access to food and some are less, um, that does associate it with lower well-being to be faced with that source of stress. So these are things that are, are a sort of direct mental health problems that are very clearly linked to some of the impacts of climate change. But now I want to think about climate change in a slightly different way. This may be a little bit more psychological. Um, when we think about what is our understanding of climate change, here are some more headlines that I've gleaned over the past year, let's say. Superbugs. We don't even know what that means, just looking at that, but it sounds bad. We don't want superbugs. We don't want a tipping point in the Amazon. We don't want scientists to be freaking out. Um, doomsday clock, I don't think I need to, to point out the problem there. And tipping points for the planet. And, and these are all from, rep these are not from weird sites. These are from reputable news sites. Um, these are the kinds of headlines that they are posting. So this is a headline from about a week ago, less than a week. The young are the most unhappy people in the US. Um, the World Happiness Report recently showed that the US has dropped out of the top 20 for the first time. Um, and uh, the primary reason for that is that young people, um, the age of many of you in the United States, are experiencing declined happiness. And one reason, there's many, you know, potentially many reasons, um, but they do also mention climate change. So another headline, the idea that crushing anxiety is part of the new normal. Um, it's hyperbole. I don't really believe that's true. but. But we do see that increased incidence of really negative emotions. And here are some of the ways in which I've seen this anxiety be described. Um, uh, these are quotes from climate activists that I've heard. Um, any of you who are interested in clinical psychology might sort of see a clinical relevance of this. So I feel this panicky physical manifestation of my anxiety. I couldn't eat properly, I would freeze. This is not a healthy state to be in. So anxiety is definitely growing. We know anxiety is growing. Anxiety is not necessarily a bad thing. You know, we, I would say, have um, evolved to experience anxiety as a kind of warning sign that something's wrong, something needs our attention, 
we need to pay attention to this problem so that we can try to solve it. So anxiety can be an adaptive response, um, again, when we're faced with a problematic scenario. But it can also be dysfunctional. And so with my colleague, Brian Carazia, um, we developed a scale to measure climate change anxiety or climate anxiety. And the idea is to say, is this experience of anxiety associated with climate change uh, actually a threat to mental health? Just checking in my time. So climate anxiety does become a mental health problem if it's actually impairing your ability to function. And when we, when we developed our scale, we found two subscales, one that got at the idea that your anxiety was impairing your thoughts and emotions. So a sample item would be, my thoughts about climate change make it difficult for me to concentrate. So it's going to impair your ability to do those kinds of cognitive tasks. Or it can interfere with your behavioral functioning. So I can't have fun because of my concerns about climate change. Um, I can't sleep. I can't do my work. And people who, most people do not experience these extreme levels of climate anxiety, but some do. And a score on the climate anxiety scale is associated with scores on established measures of mental health problems, including depression and anxiety. And it's now been used in, um, I don't know how many countries, but many countries around the world. And it's, pretty, it's consistently found to correlate with mental health problems. So who is worried? Who's worried about climate change? Well, the short answer is everyone. And you can see this, uh, I, I, and I point this out because it's fairly consistent that people under, under acknowledge or under recognize how everybody else is concerned. But if you see national surveys in the US, you know, 60 to 70% of people or more are concerned and want, for example, the government to be doing more about it. But particularly young people are more concerned. They're more worried. And that's not surprising for many reasons. The, I think the, the primary one is that young people know they're going to be faced with greater extent of climate change than older people are on average. Uh, it's also true that um, for younger generations, they've kind of grown up knowing that climate change was a reality, whereas for people who are a few decades older, they're still kind of wrapping their mind around that recognition. And you do see that kind of generational shift. So young people are more worried because they're just used to it and they're not, they're not still getting used to accepting it. But also people who are more vulnerable to climate change impacts are more worried, and that's not surprisingly. Um, here's some pretty colors for you to look at. This is a, a study for, that was done. Um, we were able to survey 10,000 people, 1,000 in each of 10 countries around the world. And we just tried to pick countries that would have different exposure to climate change. Um, you, could, you can look at this more carefully. What I want to point out are, are several things. One is, um, at the top, it just shows all countries. And the, the sort of bluish gray bar says how many of them said their worries about climate change were affecting their ability to function, just affecting their ability to live their lives. And 45% around the world said that. So that's one thing. Um, the green and the purple squares are the people who weren't worried. Um, or, or only a little bit worried. So you can see for every single country, the majority are at least moderately worried. The US, where is it? Uh, there we go. They're relatively unworried compared to some other countries, but that doesn't mean they're not worried. You still have like 73% of people at least moderately worried. You see the people who are most worried, the Philippines. 49% of them are extremely worried. Well, I would be too if I lived in the Philippines. And I actually um, gave a talk on Friday by Zoom to a Philippine group. Um, yes, they were worried. And Nigeria, India, Brazil, places that are experiencing very significant impacts of climate change, they're more worried. Women tend to be more worried. And this is from the same study. Um, Partly that women are just more likely to be able to report on their own emotions. So we're not, it's not completely clear if men are also worried, but they're just not as willing to talk about it. But you do see um, these greater, sorry, uh, these greater levels of all kinds of emotions expressed by women than by men. 
And as I said, people with experience of climate change are more likely to, to express climate anxiety. And we had this fortuitous study um, back in, I believe this was 2021, when there was the heat dome in uh, the northwestern United States as well as British Columbia. And before the heat dome, there happened to have been an online study that measured climate anxiety. Then we had the heat dome. They thought, wait, we have to see if this made a difference. So they collected another wave of data and found that yes, climate anxiety had significantly increased after the heat dome. So should we care about anxiety? Um, why is anxiety a problem? Shouldn't people just like pull themselves together and get on with their life? Well, definitely um, this anxiety, as I've just been saying, can impair your ability to function in ways that can actually compromise your mental health, but also just everything else you do. In the, in the study I've just been talking about with 10,000 people, people reported, and these were young people between the ages of 16 and 25, people reported some very negative thoughts. Um, and I've been involved in a subsequent study that has looked at the US and these thoughts are still present. So um, a, an alarmingly high proportion of people say things like, humanity is doomed, or the future is frightening. It also is affecting people's, or seems to be affecting people's attitudes towards their government and the political system. People reported feeling betrayed by their government. They said the government was failing in its responsibility to take care of its citizens. And they said they didn't trust the government to rely on the science, for example. And in um, some slightly more anecdotal evidence, although more is accumulating, Oops. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, people talk about their plans for the future being impaired by their concern about climate change. So one of the biggest things that uh, people ask about or talk about is um, a fear of having children. And I think this is something that interests a lot of people. So uh, there's a lot of stories about it. In our study of 10,000 young people, um, we found 39% said they were hesitant to have children because of their concerns about climate change. Um, now, my guess is most people who are hesitant to have children, you know, will probably end up having them anyway. Um, the point is, it may affect the population, um, but I'm more concerned with just the fact that people are even having to think about this issue. They're thinking, do I want to bring children into this world? They're making decisions about where they want to live that are based in part on climate change. And um, you can't read this, but this, uh, the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication does this massive survey every year. They've been doing it for probably at least 20 years. And it says about one in 10 Americans had considered moving to avoid the impacts of global warming. Um, I've talked to people in Minnesota who say, oh yeah, this migration up to the northern parts of the US is a thing. Some beginning suggestion that it might affect people's financial plans, and I have not seen any studies about this, but I saw this, um, this tweet. I don't know if what, what I'm supposed to call those anymore. This, this posting on X. Um, just, yo millennials. <laughs> Genuine question, have you been wondering if there's any point paying into a pension? Um, and uh, so, which is an interesting question. And then what was interesting is the follow-up where the person said, well, this blew up. Apparently uh, there was a huge response to that. So if people are thinking there's no point saving for the future, that's a big deal. And this is a, 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 a comment I've also heard anecdotally. I heard a climate activist saying, what's the point in planning for the future when we don't know if there'll even be a future or what that future will look like? And then just a little, uh, Humor aside, but this is a real story. Um, apparently, climate change was the number one concern on OKCupid in 2022. Um, and so they posted this on Tinder. Who do you want to meet up with? Someone to save the planet with. So um, yes, apparently, climate change concern is affecting people's dating. So it is affecting the way people are thinking about their lives very broadly. And it's more than just anxiety, it's more than worry. Um, you also people talk, hear people talk about grief, guilt, um, anger, and moral outrage. So I wanna just say a, a, a couple of things about this idea of a moral component. People who study emotions talk about various moral emotions that are associated with a sense that something is unethical or unvirtuous or wrong in some way. 
If those emotions are directed at yourself, it could be a feeling of guilt or shame, or conversely, pride, if you feel like you've done something good and, and, and virtuous. If they're directed at other people, um, emotions like anger or disgust or contempt. And psychologists have studied this idea of moral injury and moral outrage, which is a sense that ethical norms are being violated. It was first studied, uh, to my knowledge, I think it was first studied with um, war veterans who might have experienced, might have witnessed or even participated in some acts that they were uncomfortable with. Um, and the, the concept is now being applied to climate change. That idea that you're participating in or at least witnessing some activities that feel morally wrong. And Blanche Verley has put it this way, that climate change affects people's sense of themselves as morally competent individuals. So in our study of 10,000 young people, 50% said they felt guilt and 46% said they felt ashamed. 50% um, felt angry. Um, climate scientists have talked about frustration and anger at other people for not taking action. Now, notably, uh, the emotional response might be different depending on where you're situated. So people who are in developed Western societies are more likely to feel guilt, um, but people in the global south are more likely to feel anger. And why? Because part of the story of climate change is this massive inequity that things are not evenly distributed. Um, even within the United States, very clearly, people are not all exposed to the same level of hazard from climate change. And around the world, that's even more true. When uh, policies are designed to address climate change, the benefits of those policies are not equally distributed in many cases. And when we have people dis making decisions about what to do about climate change, not everybody is equally well represented at those discussions. So all of that um, is part of the inequity that, uh, that we see happening. There's also that sense of um, if you feel responsible, you're going to feel that, those sort of moral emotions. And the fact that people, the people who are most, I shouldn't really say people, I should say countries, the, the countries and, and entities that are most responsible for the effects of climate change are not the same as the people and countries that are experiencing the impacts. These are very unevenly distributed. And it is places like India and Brazil and Africa and the Philippines and Nepal um, where you're really seeing significant impacts of climate change and an almost negligible, uh, setting aside Brazil, almost a negligible um, contribution to climate change. And I think this moral distress matters um, partly because it's just, it's part of human experience and we need to understand it. And, uh, and we don't want people walking around feeling moral distress, but also it can affect how they cope with the situation. So a negative sort of response to moral distress can be um, either a moral licensing where you think, okay, I did this one good thing, now I'm allowed to do the bad thing. You know, I bought my LED light bulb, so now I'm allowed to, I don't know, you know, go on a road trip. Um, and it also often includes moral disengagement. So you try and convince yourself that you're not really acting immorally. One way to do that is to blame the victim or deny that they're really experiencing harm, um, deny that you're personally responsible or justifying it. And I don't mean to imply that I mean, we all do this. This, this is how we, we can function because we all do things that create harm and we have to live with ourselves. But clearly, if you get too involved in this whole moral disengagement, it will impair um, our ability to feel empathy. It will impair our ability to address the problem. There are some positive sides, too, of moral distress, um, which is that perceiving a moral aspect to environmental issues does tend to lead people to support taking action to address them and especially feeling a moral anger, a righteous anger about environmental injustice promotes more pro-environmental intentions and behavior. And I think a lot of people, um, you may have seen clips of Greta Thunberg, um, when she speaks, she's really angry. Uh, a lot of people I think have felt very validated by hearing her um, talk about these emotional response, this feeling that climate change is just wrong. So speaking of inequities, I do want to point out that um, the mental health impacts of climate change depend on a 
a number of factors. It's not just did you experience the impacts, it's also how vulnerable you were and what sources of support you have. And those sources of support could be social, uh, they could be economic, they could be political. Um, not everybody has access to the same ones. So definitely some groups are at greater risk. Um, people obviously who, some people live in areas that are more vulnerable, and I already talked about that, the low-lying islands, the coastal areas, um, people who depend on glaciers for fresh water. Some people are actually physiologically more vulnerable. So I think most of us know by this point that the elderly are particularly vulnerable to heat. When you have a heat wave, um, you hear these reports of, of you know, severe consequences to elderly people. People who are already experiencing some sort of mental illness are often more vulnerable to the effects of climate change for a variety of reasons. Um, some having to do with their medication, for example. People with disabilities are often left out or insufficiently considered in evacuation plans. So there might be um, broadcast announcements of the need to evacuate with no uh, concern for those who are hard of hearing. Um, or, and this is, this is a real thing that sometimes happens, uh, people who try to evacuate uh, communities that are in the, the path of a storm, predicted path of a storm, have made no accommodations for those with physical disabilities. So they're just being left out of the planning. Economic vulnerability, uh, people who uh, have less money tend to be more exposed to environmental hazards. They have lower quality housing that provides less protection from the elements. They have less access to green space. And this is um, uh, particularly noticeable, I think, when it comes to heat. There have been t studies that have found that the, the temperature, I don't remember the number, it may be as much as five or seven degrees hotter in poorer neighborhoods than in well-to-do neighborhoods in the same city because the poorer neighborhoods don't have the tree cover um, and so everything just heats up more and they may not have the air conditioning. Women and children are more vulnerable and I always feel bad kind of putting them together, <laughs> women and children, but they both have sort of different physiology um, than adult males. Um, they have different social roles, different access to power and resources, and that explains their vulnerability. Particularly when it comes to women, um, they, they are more affected by heat waves. Um, if they are pregnant, they are more physiologically vulnerable. On average, women are more likely to drop out of school when a family is facing financial difficulties, which may be exacerbated by climate change. Um, this is less true in the United States, but there are places around the world where um, daughters may be married off because the family is financially stressed. And studies have shown that they're more likely to marry earlier and to less desirable marriages because the family just can't afford to feed them anymore. There's a lot of threat of sexual violence um, for displaced women, so people who are forced to migrate. In many areas, women get less access to food if there's a food shortage. Um, I already mentioned, I think, uh, interpersonal violence, domestic violence does increase following extreme weather events. Women are more likely to die in extreme weather events that are related to climate change. And they're just more worried about climate change. So when we think about what makes climate conditions stressful, it's partly the change. You know, it's not, there are lots of bad things that happen in the world. Um, but people are very stressed out about climate change because it is change, it is change at a very fundamental level. It's a change of everything, potentially. And it's unpredictably, we can't, see, we can't say exactly what Cedar City will look like in 10 years or in 20 years or in 40 years. Um, people feel a lack of control. And it's especially concern when it's a threat to things that are valued. So people who are more dependent on their environment and who uh, rely on their environment more are more likely to be vulnerable to those impacts. Indigenous peoples are especially vulnerable for that reason. And so there have been some studies that have looked at, particularly in far northern areas, um, impacts of climate change on indigenous communities. And it's been shown to, to kind of weaken their social networks, um, increase conflict, increased substance abuse problems. But it's also true, increasingly people are recognizing that uh, a lot of indigenous peoples have experienced displacement in the past you know, hello, North America, yes. Um, so they have learned to adapt to changing conditions. They've often 
really learned how to uh, essentially read and um, interact with their local environment. So they do have some lessons to learn about that kind of adapt, or sorry, lessons to teach um, mainstream society about that kind of adaptation. Farmers are also particularly vulnerable. And in fact, um, drought is strongly associated with increased mental distress and suicide among farmers. And suicide rates are very high among agricultural workers because so much, um, uh, so much unpredictability about the weather. And also among many farmers that I've spoken with, a very um, emotional connection to the land. So they really, and the same is true for indigenous communities, they really care about the environment they live in. And so when it, when it starts to change in, in negative ways, it feels very personal. So let me make sure to get to the resilience part. What can we do? So I, you know, I am taking for granted, and I, I think we all should, um, we can see that the climate is changing. Um, it is going to change more uh, no matter what we do. Um, it may change a lot more, it may change a little bit more, but it's going to continue to change. So how do we promote resilience to these kinds of changing conditions, I think we need to focus both on individual mental health and also on collective well-being. So psychologists have, of course, primarily been focused on individual mental health, and they tend to talk about two types of um, coping with stress. There's emotion-focused coping, and that's when you're just trying to deal with your own emotional response to a negative situation. So if you are dealing with a source of stress in your life, you know, fit relationship problems, work problems, health problems, you might go to a therapist and the therapist would say, let's see if we can get you to, to think differently about the problem. Let's reframe the problem, um, put it in a different kind of context. Or maybe just learn to step back. Uh, in the case of climate change, stop, stop, stop doom scrolling, stop looking at all those negative stories. Um, Find out some ways to de-stress, go for a walk, engage in um, uh, uh, mindfulness techniques, um, slow breathing, those kinds of things. And emotional skills, recognize when your emotions are threatening to get the better of you. Recognize the triggers that are really leading you to feel overwhelmed and how to calm yourself in those kinds of situations or seek out support. And these are all very useful things and very important and can help. And I, I think we should have much more you know, universal training in these kinds of skills. Um, but they don't address the problem. So some kinds of problems can be, you know, there's nothing that can be done about them or they'll, they'll resolve themselves. But in climate change, we really do need to attend to the problem. Uh, so we don't want to just restrict ourselves to emotion-focused coping. We want to think of a longer term response that might include problem focused coping. So of course, a lot of people are thinking, what can I do? How can I make my home more resilient to wildfire? How can I adapt my agricultural practices to adapt to these new conditions? Um, how can I reduce my own carbon footprint? Unfortunately, um, this kind of problem focused coping does lead to focus on the problem. Uh, which can make, make us feel more upset and anxious and sad. So we still need to, um, uh, to think about ways of, of attending to our own mental well-being by enhancing perhaps our own sources of psychological strength while also addressing the problem. And that can include self-regulation, some of the emotional skills that I talked about a minute ago, but also enhancing our connections with other people and with the natural world and with an increasing our own sense of efficacy, our increasing our trying not to feel helpless, trying to feel optimistic about the things that we can do to address the problem. So I'm a, a strong advocate of taking action to promote collective well-being. There's some evidence that taking action can actually make you more resilient because you stop feeling like a passive victim and you feel like somebody who has some agency. And you start to develop a sense of meaning. And um, uh, psychologist Maria Oyala, who has focused on how people are taught about climate change, has talked about meaning-focused coping as a nice addition to emotion-focused and problem-focused. So you, you don't sort of say, you don't focus only on solving the problem. You focus on the sense of meaning that you get from addressing the problem. And she has found in her interviews, people say they're very, uh, 
validated and encouraged and, and energized by their interactions with others by recognizing that other people also care about the problem and by coming together with other people to work on it. And developing a sense of what she's called constructive hope rather than hope based on denial. So what does that mean to talk about constructive climate change hope? Um, uh, people have described three different components. If you feel that it's beyond your control, so why bother? That's, that's a, a negative component. That's something you want to avoid. And a lot of people do feel this way. Uh, nothing I can do, so I won't bother trying to do anything. Try to avoid that. Um, what we want to develop is a personal will. I'm willing to take actions. And a collective sphere out of will and, and uh, optimism. If everyone works together, we can solve these problems. So how can we encourage this sort of broader sense of um, constructive hope? Recognizing, I'm, I'm not implying that it's easy, but one thing we need to do is recognize that social interactions can actually contribute to constructive hope. Um, if we allow people to feel that sense of self-efficacy, they're more likely to feel hopeful. So all of the messages that say there's nothing you can do are bad. <laughs> they're bad for our ability to be hopeful. We need to tell people things that they can do. And we need to provide social interactions that allow them to, um, to feel that their emotional responses are reasonable, but that other people are also concerned. So I often hear people talk about how they feel shut down when they try to talk about climate change. They say other people silence them, that there's not enough discussion of the problem, and th so therefore they don't feel hopeful because they think everybody's ignoring it. Um, it would be much better, and, and again, people tend to think I care more than other people, but everybody thinks that. So probably if you do talk about it, you'll find that other people want to talk about it as well. And people also report being told things like, uh, you're overreacting, you're making too much of things, um, that's invalidating. Instead, we should support those reactions. You know, you are concerned about the climate, good for you, that shows you're paying attention, and that shows you care about something bigger than yourself. So to address climate change and to create hope and to promote resilience, we need to think not just about our own individual actions, but, ha but um, expanding those into a broader systemic level, our interpersonal interactions, our community programs, and our societal policies to really be resilient, resilient excuse me, in the face of, these, of the climate crisis. Um, the very first step is, I think, a social acknowledgement of the problem. Again, we've had problems. There are lots of problems in society. We've, we've talked about, you think, oh yes, this is a problem. People are thinking about it. People are trying to do something about it. Um, we need to do the same with climate change. It's a problem. People are thinking about it. People are trying to come up with solutions. Part of that should include education for everybody so they know what's happening and they know how to prepare for these changes. And include something as simple as healthy urban design with more cooling centers in hot places, more more urban wildlife, uh, more trees, and also includes greater attention to mental health care because one thing we know is that mental health is declining right now worldwide and within the United States. Um, so to address the climate crisis, we also need to address the mental health crisis. And we can't, I think, address the mental health crisis without addressing the climate crisis. And that is my last slide. So thank you very much.